Hello and welcome to How Hollywood Works. I'm your host, Molly Hirsch, and today we have a very special guest, three-time Emmy Award winner, director, writer, producer, and creator of Arrested Development, what? Mitch Hurwitz. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, there's no audience. I see. I'm sorry. I was expecting... <laughs> There we oh, go. Oh, you guys. Mitch. Thank I'm very you. Very happy to have Thank you. Thank you. So nice to be here, yeah. Molly. So happy you're here. Yeah. So, Arrested Development. Y what? Let, let's talk about it. It was this insane show with, you know, the, the banana stand based around the banana stand and cousins who had a crush on each other and yep. the dad had a twin and religious man in jail and the <laughs> man with the hook. I mean, it's such bizarre scenarios. Yet it was grounded and it worked. What inspired you? Well, it's a completely true story. I don't. I never really have said that before, but I, I didn't want you people to know that. First, but it's every word of it is is true. Uh, what inspired it um, was. I mean, there's a lot of things that inspired the tone. A lot of it kind of comes from Chris Guest movies and from um, Gary Shandling had an amazing show um, called the Larry Sanders Show, which I highly recommend for you guys. <laughs> and um, Jeffrey Tambor was on it, and uh, and that also had a very similar kind of tone. It was very real, I think, um, and I kind of got into this idea of uh, heightened things dealt with in a in a super realistic manner. I wasn't completely aware of that. I think a lot of times people, particularly people who are trying to break into a creative field, feel like they have to know what their tone is already and know what their style is. And I don't think people ever really know what their style is. So I just it was just what I found funny, yeah. and it was based on. In a funny way, it was based on my father's family. And he had worked for his father for many years and had never kind of taken over the business. And he had three siblings. And I just liked the idea of, you know, William Faulkner writes a lot about siblings. And that's what I was studying when I was in high school and college. So there was just a lot of family dynamics. But then, because I'd come from comedy, I just wanted everything to be a little wacky. Yeah. I remember with like, Buster losing his arm. There's a lot of a, a, a lot of movement in here. <laughs> um, no, it's good. Please come in. Come in. There's a tour. Um, there's just there's a tram stop here. I don't know if you know this. This is a Hollywood landmark. Yeah. Um, so uh, I like with the Buster losing his hand actually came out of me sending an email to the writers between season one and season two, saying, Hey, as you're away this this summer, don't just think about you know, stories about people going on dates. I mean, think of ridiculous things. Let's let's kind of break the rules a little bit. And I wrote, bad example, Buster gets his hand bitten off by a seal. And I sent it off. And then I thought about it for a little bit. I sent another email. I said, no, that's a good example. Just, we have to do so Buster. It's so ridiculous visits. that it works. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. And even Tony Hale, who plays Buster, was very concerned about it. I told him, I'm so excited. Uh, that was such a great idea. <laughs> so, Tony, you're going to lose your hand this year. And he said, oh, oh. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I really use it a lot for <laughs> when I act. I said, well, Tony, you're still going to have a hand. We're not going to take your hand away from you. Yeah, but I, I, I just, I, it just freaked him out. As it, you know, yeah. it, it kind of was like telling somebody we're taking a limb. And, uh, and actually, my wife is the one that said to him, Tony, it means more screen time. It means they have jokes for you. Yeah. Uh, and then once he got into it, he really got and into it. And in a way, it sounds like if he's unfamiliar with that, then it makes him a better actor too. Because yeah. he learns to That's a really good act point. without his hand. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's a really good point, actually. Yeah. Sometimes, I always felt that way with Jeffrey Tambor, that he was our most experienced actor in terms of just, not, a, not our oldest necessarily, but just somebody who'd done the most amount of work. And um, I always liked that we gave him this acting exercise where we put him in prison that the table was nailed down, the chairs were nailed down. He didn't even have funny wardrobe. He just had to wear the same thing. He got no props. He could maybe a coffee cup. And it was like this great acting challenge. Like, okay, so it's all got to be you. You can't hide behind any of the tricks that actors like to use. So that's a really astute point. Like, it's, it goes to this idea of the more um, constraints you have in creativity, to me, sometimes the more creative you creative. can be. Yeah, definitely. It's like that if, if, if somebody said, I want to be a writer, when I wanted to be start out and wanted to be a writer, I thought, so what does that mean? Do I want to be a novelist or a playwright? You know, do I want to be, a t I didn't even think of TV writer. But as that, as I got more and more into a specific field, I got more and more creative within it. Incredible. And so, speaking of the casting, how, how did you, because each character, each actor that you have really seems to 
fit their role so nicely. Yeah, that's, I, yeah, I feel that way too. <laughs> yeah, how, what was the process in casting? Uh, you know, that this? one I had written very, you know, usually you do write, uh, in television and film, you kind of write with some models in your mind. And usually you'll kind of write, you know, you picture a guy as Zach Galifianakis and you kind of get a voice from it. And I didn't do that with this one. It was, a lot of it was invention, but a lot of it were just kind of composites of my family, exaggerations. You know, it's almost like drawing a caricature more than drawing a portrait. Um, and so I, I had an idea in my mind and I also thought there's no way we're going to be able to cast this. The way television works is you get a pilot, you know, they get the network to agree to make your pilot. And if you can't cast it, it just kind of kicks down the road and maybe you do it next year. We had three weeks to cast it. And I really felt like there's no way. First of all, it's pilot season. So everybody's going after the same funny actors. Um, these parts are so specific. I had no idea who could play Michael Bluth. The closest I had was Jeremy Piven. Do you know who that is? He's yeah. on Entourage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Ron Howard had suggested him. He said, you know, maybe Jeremy Piven. And I was scared that he would punch me in the face <laughs> or in the stomach, I guess. <laughs> Um, because I'd heard he's volatile. Actually, he's a very nice guy. But, um, <laughs> but and also, he was kind of his star was just exploding, so it was going to be tough to get him. Jason Bateman came in to read for that, and Jason Bateman had just done, you know, like maybe six years of back-to-back -back pilots. And I thought, ah, he's overexposed. He does these shows that don't turn into, you know, I don't, I don't want to do the Jason Bateman pilot. I really didn't know what he did. I knew that he was a child actor, and the whole thing just seemed like, I don't want to do the Jason Bateman thing. And of course, he came in and was great. And he was great in a really, he was just like what you see on the screen, you know. But it was unexpected. Like, I thought he was going to come in and do kind of that sitcom performance, you know, which is much more expository. It's, you're really yeah. playing to an audience. Um, but he didn't. He just did that very dry, very still. How can I talk you out of ever making that face again, Mom? <laughs> you know, just very, very kind of controlled. And uh, so that was kind of amazing. I chased him into the hall. He was about to do another audition. I said, don't, don't do any more auditions. I said, really? He said, yeah, 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 don't do it. Um, so I kind of had him. And then, um, and then every other one of them, I could not get a Job. Everybody came in and played Job as like a New Yorker for some reason. Hey, George Michael, how you doing? <laughs> They all did that, and I would say, yeah, it's great. Can you do it? It's less street. You know, it's country club. Got it. Hey, George Michael, how you doing? I'm like, okay, well, we're still kind of <laughs> going Brooklyn here. Um, and I brought a couple people into the network. You have to take them into the network. In this case, it was Fox. And then show the, show, you know, the executives there, the actors reading the parts. And th we, they didn't like our choice of Job, and I didn't either. I mean, I liked him, but it just wasn't right for the part. And uh, the head of the network, I remember saying, okay, Mitch, this is how pilots fall apart. We're not going to do this unless you have a brother. And the casting director, you know, there's always a casting director on these shows that really this is the person that knows all the actors and goes to all the improv clubs and that kind of thing, so really knows who's out there. Um, and she said, I've got Will Arnett interested in doing this. And I turned around and I said, I mean, Will Arnett is, is great. You guys know Will Arnett? They didn't. I said, oh, he's amazing. I didn't know Will Arnett. <laughs> you know, but it was like, it, I really had no idea who it was. But she had just kind of come up with it. Yeah. And he sent in a tape or something or flew in. I'm trying to remember. what. No, he sent in a tape. And I just very reluctantly looked at it because it was kind of my last chance. And it's Will Arnett. You know, like he'd been coming, he'd been doing drama in New York. This insane comedian, this really brilliant, gifted, comedic dude, had just been doing all these dramas, and uh, he was amazing. Michael Sarah, I had really wanted Michael Sarah because I'd seen him in a pilot, and I kept saying, "What's going on with Michael Sarah? What, what's going on with the kid from the pilot?" I'd asked the casting director. What, we, we never heard back from him. Oh, we're we're waiting, we're waiting, and finally she said, "Michael Sarah was probably 14 at this time." And finally she said, oh, great news, Michael Sarah liked the script, which I was amazed by. I mean, I was really impressed by it. I said, that's what we've been waiting for? <laughs> to see if he likes the script? I mean, imagine a 14-year-old actor that is holding out that standard as opposed to just saying, oh, there's a part? Great, sign me up. Nope, 
even as a 14-year-old, he was oh. very discerning and he liked the part. So he made an audition tape and he, I remember him standing across the room from the, the camera and he did that Michael Sarah thing. Hey, maybe. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. awkward. Awkward. And well, we're cousins. Right? <laughs> and so I remember showing it, the tape comes in and you could not tell if it was just a kid doing nothing or if it was an actor doing an amazing job of acting like a kid who's doing nothing. You couldn't tell. It really just seemed like, I mean, and also very courageous of him to not send in kind of a hammy, over-the-top audition. Yeah, and I mean, speaking of that, all of these actors really did not, they didn't overdo it. They did exactly yeah. what they needed to do. It was so nonchalant. Yeah, their, that's their performances. interesting. Except for David Cross. And I, I just offered David Cross the part because he's so funny and I knew his work. And I said, just any part you want, really. And then I was worried he'd say Michael, which is the Jason Bateman part. <laughs> oh, that's not going to be a very good show. But, um, and he wanted to do Tobias. So I said, great. And I never talked to him again. We were, we'd shot for a couple days, and we'd been doing this ultra-realistic thing, really dry, everybody taking everything very seriously. And David Cross came in. I probably can't stand, so I'll just kind of try to act it in my seat. We were shooting. Like, I didn't even see him rehearse it or anything. All right, so Michael's talking to his mother. All right, Mom, well, you know, we got to do something about this. You know what, Michael? Y you know, mind your own business, whatever. And then all of a sudden, the door to the kitchen opens, and out comes Tobias. Michael! And he kind of does this walk over to Michael. <laughs> How are you? And I realized, like, this is a nice, this doesn't work. This is a, it's such a different tone. And I, it also almost seemed like a high school student playing an adult. You know what I mean? Except the high school student maybe would do it a little more subtly. <laughs> but, you know, just, I'm a grown up. And, uh, and then, then Michael said, how are you? And he did that thing where he went, I'm good. <laughs> and I, then I just, I barked with laughter. And it turns out it worked perfectly, at least to me. The fact that there was this hy sort of hyper-realistic family, but the in-law was just a little broader. He wasn't part of the core group. I mean, that was an interesting detail that yeah. pointed you toward the reality of the family. Yeah, it way. definitely works. And I mean, the, the family in the show is so dysfunctional that it's like a real family. <laughs> yeah, I d it was not, um, I was trying to avoid a sentimental depiction of it. I think there's a big difference between sentimentality and emotion. And sentimentality is like syrupy emotion. And it's the stuff that a lot of sitcoms use and, you know, it can be effective too. But it's, I kind of thought, you know what, if we make the family seem a little less loving, it'll be more meaningful, actually, when, you know, Michael embraces his son or the brother and sister decide, all right, you know what, let's be on the same team. Or they confront their mother and say in one of the episodes, I think they said something like, stop being so mean. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? There's just something about it that seemed more relatable to me. Yeah. But interestingly, it wasn't relatable at the time. I mean, we got very low ratings. Yeah, and, and it was canceled. It was canceled. But yep. then it seems that when the show was canceled, after it was canceled, you had a mass cult following after. It very slowly happened, and I didn't, um, you know, what... I think kept it from working on broadcast television was all the detail and the fact that you had to really pay attention to it. And I think what made it have a following was all the detail, the fact that you had to pay attention to it. It just didn't work as something that was just on TV in the background. But once people started watching it on you know, DVD, a lot of people found it on DVD, a lot of people found it on iTunes. How did you find it? On DVD, my parents used to get it on DVD. How funny, yeah. And we just started watching it. So you would the choose show. to watch it. You would like elect to watch it as opposed to it's just on. And that's like a big difference. I think that's why Netflix is changing things because, you know, your generation is used to saying like, I'd like, to, I want to watch something. I don't want to just it's have right noise. There for you. Yeah. Yeah, but it very slowly happened and I considered it a failed show for a very long time. And, you know, I started noticing, like, college kids were talking about it. When it was on the air, Nielsen, which is the rating company, didn't include college campuses as part of their numbers. It just didn't. They just wrote it off. It said, it doesn't matter. We're just looking at families. So I do think it had more people watching than ever showed up in the ratings. But slowly, like, the fact that it was dense, I think people rewatched it, and it, it kind of lived a little longer. Definitely. And the actors, going back to yeah. all these actors, after they've 
were on the show, they had these mass careers and everyone, I mean, Michael Sarah has I been know. in all these movies. Was it hard to bring them all back to do the show seven years later? You know, I feel like it was very hard to get them free at the same time. But I, but it was, it's their show, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think they, like me, wanted to do more and wanted to come back to it. Um, but it was really hard to get their schedules to work. And, and so the original idea of that fourth season was just, I was going to just do these webisodes. That was kind of my idea. You know what? I'll, I'll get my feet wet and I'll, I'll reintroduce them to the audience. I'll just do these 15-minute shows. It'll, one will just be about maybe and one will just be about Job. And that was all it was going to be. And then I met um, Ted Sarandos, who runs Netflix, who's been on the show. And, um, he's been on the show. He's been on the show. I didn't yeah. know that. Oh, he's been on this show. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, on this show, yes. Okay. I, thought, <laughs> yeah, I gotta get <laughs> you some tapes. <laughs> Can we show Molly some of the people <laughs> that have been on the show, show that are perhaps more impressive than me? Um, no, no, but so he runs Netflix, and, um, and he's my friend Tony Sarandos' father, yeah. by the way. He's how I know Tony. <laughs> um, but I started talking to him, and I loved him. He's such a funny guy, and he was so willing to do this. And so excited about Arrested coming back that I started thinking, oh, maybe I should do more than just these webisodes. So it started kind of growing. But the, uh, the idea always was, let me just do 10 in or 9 individual stories and then get everybody into this state of peril. And then the movie will come out and the movie will, you know, take it the rest of the way. Now the family comes together. Um, and I ended up kind of doing a hybrid of that with the series because it started getting press. Arrested's coming back. I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, that's how not. my family started getting into Netflix was that we... How excellent. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, but it was also like this feeling of like, oh, it's not what they're going to expect. <laughs> and, and it was, and, you know, we could only get the actors for a week at a time and then little sporadic days here and there. So it was a very unusual way to do a show. I broke the whole story for all what became 15 episodes. And I put all the scenes on cards on a wall, and then there was string connecting like, okay, George Michael's scene co connects to Michael's scene, so this scene's going to be in both shows, but this scene has to, he's got a different attitude than we realize in this show. It was just this really complex mathematical formula. And then on top of that, we'd find out, okay, on Tuesday we don't have Michael Sarah, but we do have Portia and we do have Tony Hale. Is there anything you can shoot with them? I'd have to look at the board and go, well, there's a scene in a restaurant. We've got to build a restaurant. It was really difficult. It was really hard. Um, and then I got into post, and I just had millions of pieces of 15 shows that, you know, none of them were edited yet. So it was really an intense experience. Yeah. So, uh, so how did making Arrested Development for Fox differ than making it for Netflix? Um, it differed a lot. Um, first of all, at Fox, you know, it's a big machine and it and there are a lot of employees and there are a lot of people that have opinions and their business model is we need 20 million people to watch this All right so the way it works the way Hollywood works um, now as well as in the 70s is there's in television anyway there's a studio and a network you can kind of think of the studio as a bank kind of although they do a lot more than that they also make the show and then there's the network. So the network pays for half of a television show, and the studio pays for half of a television show. The network gets their money back immediately from advertisers, right? That's all that advertising time. And the studio is in a whole different business. So if Arrested Development co costs $2 million an episode, a million of it comes from the network, they get their money back. The studio puts out a million dollars and has to wait till there are 100 episodes to sell it for maybe $300 million. It's a, It's a really... It's a big gamble because every episode's costing them a million dollars. So in the case of Arrested Development, we made 53 episodes. That cost them $53 million, and it was canceled. And so it really appeared at the time like, well, that's $53 million gone. They're not going to get that back. They did get it back, as it turns out, just because of the life of that show. But because there's so much money at stake, there is a lot of concern about how do we make this show work for the broadest possible audience. And w my attempt at doing that was making everything really specific and really dense and really funny. But it did appear at the time that it was driving audiences away instead of bringing them toward us. So it was a lot of struggle. It was a lot of getting notes, a lot of 
trying to take the notes, but also keeping the spirit of the show the way it is. Um, once I got to Netflix, they just loved the show and just said, do what you do, you know, which was shocking and confusing, frankly. Yeah, it was challenging. And then you were left with all your <laughs> I know. scenes. I know. That's why, like, <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, I think if I'd done that at, at Fox, they would have said, Mitch, you can't shoot for 80 straight days little pieces of shows all over the place and just hope they all come together in post. You know, I did five months in post. I mean, none of this is done in TV. You make a show, you edit the show, you air it like two weeks later. We didn't do any of that. Yeah. But Netflix is great. I mean, it's, I, do you, you watch it. Yeah. You use it. What do you mostly watch on it? House of Cards. I love oh, House really? Of Cards. Yeah. So you're watching their original stuff. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's the big... So Netflix began as, as you guys know, but it began as like DVDs through the mail. And then it kind of um, migrated, which was always their intention, to streaming yeah. video. You learned all this in Ted. With Ted. And, and now they're going to this new field, which is like, okay, well, why don't we just make stuff? You know, and it does mean like, I think it's really good for consumers because it means not every show is going to be for everybody. You know, and when you try to make every show for everybody, y you kind of... You know, imagine making a meal that you just want 700 people to like. Yeah. You kind of take the spice out of it, you know? And they really individualize it, too. With yeah, yeah. As opposed shows to... That shows that you would like based on what you've watched before. Exactly. As opposed to, you know, testing is a big part of Hollywood. They always test shows. In fact, the reason I did, at the end of the pilot, the reason it, it says, on the next Arrested Development... Because it was a pilot, there was no next arrest development. I mean, there were no clips from the next, you know, we're only commissioned to do one. But I knew that in testing, one of the questions they always ask is, would you want to watch another show? So it was just an exploitation of that. I was just trying to find a, a kink in the system so that I would show people, here's what happens on the next one. And then when they were asked the question, would you like to watch the next one? They'd say, yeah, yeah, I want to see what happens when he's in prison. I want to see what happens when that she's taking the shower and the boy's trying to lick. <laughs> it's total, like, exploitation. But Netflix doesn't do that. And, you know, the other problem with testing, Steve Jobs talked about this a lot, who I always want to call Steve Jobs, by the way. <laughs> but um, I just do it all the time by mistake. But he talked about they always wanted to test, like, the iPod. Would people use it? They want to do market surveys on whether they want the iPhone. And his point was always, we need to tell them what they want. They don't know. They don't have it yet. And with a show like Arrested, that's what's challenging about it. You can't ask people, would you watch this? You know, because would you watch a show that has a bunch of storylines and is really specific and it's not the warmest show in the world? You know, the answer is going to be no. So that you fit your audience yeah. along the way. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so you said that Arrested Development was inspired by your dad's family and yeah. people from your own life. So where are you from? <laughs> I'm from Orange County. You are such a good interviewer. Oh, thank you. Are you aware of this? Are thank you. you thank are you, you. Do you appreciate this? <laughs> I've been interviewed by people before, and you can just tell they're not listening, and they're just looking at their notes, as I would, by the way, trying to figure out <laughs> what question am I going to ask next. No, she I like look it. Down, We're having a conversation. doesn't look down. She listens. Then she remembers, <laughs> like, what I said. It's really, like, Jay Leno was not this good. Anyway, um... So, uh, yes, I'm from Orange County, California, which is south of here. We're in Beverly Hills now. And I always thought, you know, I always loved comedy. I was in drama. I did all that stuff. Um, and I always thought, I can't be a real writer ever. I can't be a real comedy writer because I'm from Orange County. You know what I mean? It's like Irvine. I don't know if you guys know Orange County. But it's really kind of homogenized. It's very white. It's like the architecture isn't interesting. It, it's everything's landscaped nicely. And I, you know, it's just like, well, this isn't funny. And, <laughs> I, you know, you kind of assume like, I grew up reading Mad Magazine. I didn't know any of the references, but it was all cities and subways and muggers and things like that. It's like, well, that's what you need. And it wasn't until I was sitting down to write a pilot that I kind of thought, you know, I'd heard this my whole career, like write what you know and write from your own life experience. And probably like a lot of people, I thought, well, my life's boring. There's nothing to write about. But there was. Like, there was stuff in Orange County. That th there was stuff to talk about there and about, you know, y you really just want something to make fun of. Yeah. You know, a big part of comedy is, like, getting in touch with your anger. You know? I really feel like a lot—I heard Jerry Seinfeld 
once say, when they said, where do you come up with stuff for your comedy? And he said, when I start feeling aggravated, I generally think, oh, I'll bet this is funny. Right? It's a lot of stuff that's uncomfortable, stuff that you're mad at. Um, this year on Arrested, or last year, I had this whole joke that Michael's car was going to be the Google car, the Google Maps car. And I sort of started this thing where, I, you know, I actually, this was a joke I had in high school when I was your age. People would say, we're really focused on what kind of car you're going to have as your sophomore. Yeah. And my joke was just always, oh, you know, my father bought me this um, stair car that, uh, that, you know, would pick, pe you know, you, it's really used for driving down onto the tarmac and letting people off planes. But it's a, it's a great car, and, I, you know, you get people hopping on. But other than that, so it's just an old joke of mine. And I brought it back. You kind of end up using everything in comedy, right? Every joke you've ever heard. But on the new one, I thought, okay, I need a new funny car. And so I thought of the Google car, and it was just kind of funny. And then Google said, you can't use it. And I sort of got in touch with this outrage of, like, wait a minute. The guy that drives around, it's okay that they drive around and take a picture of my house and my car in front of my house. I haven't agreed to any of this. And me walking down the front step, I have friends that are on Google Maps. I don't know if you do. I've got a couple of friends that are caught. You know, it's just really funny. <laughs> and it's like, you can invade our privacy, but we can't show the car that takes the picture? Cause you're, so I was mad. And suddenly it was like a great point of view. And then there's this whole running joke about like, we, we sort of pretended we couldn't say the word Google. <laughs> so first it would be like Ron Howard, the narrator, saying, you know, just do a something search and you'll see for yourself. But then the characters themselves would say, look, I did a something search. <laughs> it's just this weird meta thing. <laughs> so anyway, I kind of looked at what was aggravating to me about growing up in Orange County, you know. And then once you're <laughs> aggravated by it and once you kind of have like this point of view about it, like, oh, it's all white, it's all right wing and that kind of thing. Then the next step is, okay, now can I love them anyway? Can I love the characters? Otherwise, you're just doing kind of parody. You know, you're kind of doing cartoons. So that writing extra step is like, no, 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 they, they have hearts and they have desires and they have egos and, you know. So, but Orange County, man. Estancia High School, do you guys know it? No, I've never no. heard of it. You don't know Estancia? Of course you don't. <laughs> So you've always but, loved to yeah. write and, yeah. and have been a big fan of comedy. How did you take this and come to Hollywood? Um, yeah, it's, um, everybody has a, a, a reason they feel like they kind of can't get in. And even you guys at Beverly Hills High, where there are probably a lot of people that think like, well, you, you're destined for this. I'm, I'm sure there's all sorts of stuff about, yeah, but my parents did it. It's actually harder for me. There's the sense of expectation. For me, it really was a different world. Um, and I had actually started down this road of being a little businessman um, because I'd started this cookie business called The Chipyard in, in Newport Beach, which is really the banana stand, right? So it, it, I was like little George Michael on this hot. In fact, I was always making George Michael, like spraying him down so it looked like he was sweating in the <laughs> banana stand, even though it didn't make sense because there were no ovens in the banana stand. <laughs> but there were ovens in the chipyard. And my recollection of it is just sweating, getting, making cookies. Making. <laughs> um, but I loved comedy albums. I loved stand-up comedy. Um, and then once I got into high school, um, I found drama. I do remember the time my water polo coach said to me, um, Mitch, I think you need to make a decision now. It's going to be either drama or water polo because you can't do both. And I said, well, this has been great. Thank you so much. for thank. Please thank the guys for me. <laughs> And uh, do you need the helmet back, or do it, can I just keep this? Is it because it could be funny and something? But it was so clear to me. It's like I'm not going to pursue a career in water polo. <laughs> Love the workout. Got a big kick out of swimming in our shoes. That was cool. Uh, see you later. Anyway, so I loved the drama people. I loved how suddenly being with creative people at a school that where that really wasn't um, valued, you know, and you were kind of considered like. I don't know, weird to be in that stuff. Um, but I had a drama teacher that said to me in so my sophomore year, uh, okay, so and Mitch is going to write the play this year because he's one of the best writers we've ever had in this <laughs> class. And I, j I thought, oh, oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, and I remember feeling nervous about it and living up to expectations. And only later in my life did I realize, oh, she probably does that 
she probably says that about somebody. She probably says, oh, this is our best actor. This is it was just this interesting positive reinforcement I had. So I started thinking about myself as a writer. I wrote a play called Wet Paint. I was so proud of that title. So I put signs up all over like this Costa Mesa that said Wet Paint everywhere. And then it said Wet Paint coming soon. <laughs> and then did this pretty lame play, actually. But I just had developed this identity for myself as a writer. And I was very uninhibited in high school. And then I was just telling you backstage, but I, was, I got very inhibited in college. It was almost like losing a child tooth, you know? Like, oh, this, this period of my life is over. Only recently did it come back, when I, when I was getting mic'd up, actually, did I become uninhibited again. <laughs> well, yeah. there so we thanks. go. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> so um, I always ask this because there's so many people, you know, into drama and into writing here. What advice do you have for people aspiring to be in your position? Um, well, let's see. I uh, make sure you love it. That's really important. Sometimes, even in my case, I wasn't sure I loved it once I started doing it professionally. And I often had to remember, no, I love this. I love this. I was doing this when it was free in high school. But sometimes ambition gets in the way and, and feeling of like, will I live up to expectations? I think um, you have to stay curious about yourself. I think a lot of people go through a thing where they get self-conscious, they get fearful. Uh, I want to write a mystery. I still go through this. Maybe I'll do a mystery. Oh, I don't know anything about writing a mystery. What am I doing? A lot of people do this. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. And that's just fear. And the antidote to it is curiosity about yourself. Just like, forget about it being the greatest mystery ever. What is Mitch's version of a mystery? What's Molly's version of a talk show? What, you know what I mean? Like, it's about your own life. So I think that's a big part of it. Stay curious about what it would be like and try not to focus too much on the result. Because it's not going to, when I started out, I remember I, ha I confessed to my father. I sat down to write a spec script. It was for the show Cheers. That's how long ago it was. And I spent about a day and a half on it. I couldn't do anything. And I said to my father, I kind of admitted, he said, what's the matter with you? I said, I'm just, I think I might not be a good writer. You know, I'm out of college at this point, and here I've been calling myself a writer. And he said, yeah, of course you're not a good writer, which really surprised me. He said, what? <laughs> he said, why would you be a good writer? That's not just a talent. You know, I couldn't graduate law school and say, what if I can't win a case? You know, you, you have to do some bad work to get to some good work. And you might surprise yourself, and it might be good work from the start. You, you know? learn from your mistakes. Yeah, you That's learn it. from your mistakes. Absolutely. Um, so, Mitch, I am so appreciative oh, that you so came here today. To Thank here. you so much. I'm so sorry you didn't get the Leno job. Oh, You would have well. been so perfect. <laughs> you don't have the chin for it, but. I know. Maybe the I'm Craig Ferguson. <laughs> that would be really we'll cool, see. wouldn't it? Like a, like a sophomore in high school doing the Craig Ferguson show. We had to do it at three because I can't stay up that late. <laughs> I have homework. Sorry. Yeah, I got homework. You know. today. Anyways, so that's Holly how Hollywood works. There it is. That's all you there need to know. Thank you, You could Mitch. pretty much end the series, I think, with this one. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Thank so you. So nice to meet you. So nice to have you here today. There we go. Bye, guys. Bye. Hello, this is Mitch Hurwitz, creator of Arrested Development, and you're watching KBEV, probably because you lost your remote control. <laughs> <laughs>